We are moving into another series of panels. The next one uh, is a fantastic lineup of great, great, great minds. Some of our favorite students who are going to be talking to you about systems reform and some casework and studies that they've done around that. Uh, the moderator for this session is going to be Ben Carver, one of our current um, STML 2022 certificate students, also a great guy, a great mind, and um, an all-around great moderator, so you'll enjoy that. Uh, our first, and then I'm going to introduce, like we did before, the three speakers now so that you know who's going to be in the panel, and then we don't have to do a lot of transitions in between them, uh, and then we'll uh, start it with the panel itself. So uh, this panel is made up of three students. The first is James Bond. Yes, the James Bond. Uh, he also has a son named James Bond and a father named James Bond. So it's a Bond family. Uh, James is a first year fellow at the Cornell Institute for Public Affairs. He has a concentration in public and nonprofit management and is also a member of the uh, upcoming uh, cohort of students pursuing a certificate in systems thinking, modeling, and leadership. And then we also have Daniel Sharfrez, who is a current student uh, in the public administration program here, and he focuses on environmental policy, also uh, will be graduating next year and part of the STML certificate program for the year to come. And last and certainly not least, we have Ronnie Schinker, who is currently a fellow at Institute for Public Affairs. She has a concentration in human rights and social justice. And uh, just since February 2021, she's been doing an internship with the St. Regis Mohawk Tribe. And she's been conducting research and worked with tribal stakeholders on de developing comprehensive strategies for justice. And I think you'll find all three of these panelists will be very interesting and come together in a nice theme about reforming systems of interest. So with that, I will turn it over to our first panelist, uh, James Bond. Thank you, Laura, and good afternoon, everyone. I will go ahead and get the slides up. All right, everyone see that? Excellent, thank you. Well, thank you again for that introduction. Uh, so today we're gonna continue uh, our exploration into the agent-based approach. And I would like to share with you how I utilize the agent-based approach to understand and analyze a complex adaptive system and provide recommendations based on my findings. So as you can see by the title, I'm looking at the relationship between the military and climate change. And so I will be the first to confess that I am not a subject matter expert on addressing climate change within the military. I do have experience in the military, and I was extremely curious about the impact of climate change on the military. But what I do want to demonstrate, though, is that, as the Cabreras have stated, the agent-based approach is an effective method for understanding a complex system in order to make recommendations to change that system to a more desirable future state. So what does the military climate change system look like? What is the relationship between these two things? So first, let's take a look at some background. So in January, on January 27th of 2021, Executive Order 14008, Tackling the Climate Crisis at Home and Abroad, was signed by President Biden. So this executive order prioritized climate and foreign policy and national security, and it demanded a climate risk analysis and an assessment of security implications. Therefore, in September of that year, the Department of Defense released their climate adaptation plan which outlines how the Department of Defense can continue to operate and respond under the changing conditions. In October, they released their climate risk analysis, which addresses the security implications that climate change poses for the military at home and abroad. Therefore, I began with the first step of ABA, which is DSRP analysis. So through this analysis, I explored this relationship. First, the military contributes to climate change. So we know that human activity, primarily the burning of fossil fuels, has increased the concentration of greenhouse gases leading to what we know as climate change. It has been estimated that the military is the largest institutional contributor of greenhouse gas, utilizing approximately 80 to 85 million barrels of oil annually from the years 2014 to 2021. And that's based on the fiscal year 20 operational energy annual report published by the Department of Defense. In turn, climate change impacts the military. And many of these impacts are perceived as security risks. 
According to the climate risk analysis, these include the impact on the military installations, which in turn impacts the readiness of the military to respond to the other risks, which include a demand for defense support of civil authorities and increased demand for that, and increased demand of humanitarian assistance and disaster response. It includes operation in harsher environments that are limited and constrained, as well as instability within and among other nations. So going through DSRP analysis revealed a certain system of relationships that decision makers such as military commanders, defense policymakers, and legislators see when making policies. From their perspective, they see this, that the military adapts to the impacts of climate change, the risks that we mentioned, but often doesn't factor in the contribution to the cause. Now, I do want to be clear, there is an attempt for mitigating the military's contribution. But what you see in red is the primary relationship that is perceived when making decisions or creating policy. So this brings us to the Posowid, or the purpose of the system is what it does. What we know from Posowid analysis is that system structure determines system behavior. So if this is the structure, then the emergent behavior is this. By primarily focusing on the risks and how to adapt to those risks, the system creates emergent properties that bring forth increased security risks, increase in contributions to climate change because of the demand for more operations, and ultimately climate policies that will eventually fail. However, that is not the intention of any policymaker, but this is determined by the system structure. What we wanna see is this, a decrease in security risks, a decrease in the contributions to climate change, and policies that accomplish what they intend. So how do we get from red to green? Well, essentially that's where the ABA or the agent-based approach comes in. Part of positive analysis is analyzing the root difference between these states. So I found that the root difference in this case can be boiled down to whether funding prioritizes risks or the contribution, the prioritization of global competition versus global impact, whether we create policies that comply or commit to change or do we focus on the effects or the root cause? Again, the question is, how do we change this? How do we address these root differences? Well, through our understanding of complex adaptive systems, we know that agents follow simple rules and bring about emergent properties. So through CAS analysis, we look at the agents and their simple rules. As I mentioned earlier, some of the key agents are commanders, defense policymakers, and legislators and they each follow their own simple rules, which results in their system level behavior. For military commanders, this can include advising according to the current structure and capability to meet the current risks, providing reactionary capabilities, complying with the administration in office, and focusing on global competition. Defense policymakers often produce policy that responds to risks of climate change and are compliant to the current uh, administration. Legislators, in turn, vote on funding that supports response to risk of climate change and mitigate effects instead of addressing the root cause for a quick political win. So now that we see this, what do we do? Well, we can provide recommendations, recommendations that directly impact these key agents and their simple rules. So if system structure determines system behavior, then we can address different aspects of the DSRP structure through our recommendations. And I came up with three recommendations, each of which addresses a different element of DSRP. So my first recommendation addresses perspective of the agents. Recommendation one is a decision-making rubric. So it is an attempt to provide the agents an opportunity to check their bias before making a decision, providing a recommendation, or signing a policy. It is essentially a self-feedback loop expressly focused on climate change-related decisions. My second recommendation adds another distinction, in this case, another agent. Recommendation two is for non-defense input. The essence of this recommendation is adding agents with a different perspective to the group of policymakers. Currently, the decision makers for defense policy are those who are already predisposed to prioritize national security above all else. However, and I am going to use a military analogy here, the national security perspective is often short-sighted, seeking to engage a 50 meter smaller target when a more threatening, 200, uh, more threatening target is 200 meters away. So the addition of another agent into the decision-making process offers a method of affecting the emergent properties of the system. 
And my third recommendation addresses the relationships. Recommendation three is changing directions. The last recommendation seeks to change the simple rules that each of the agents follow. The flow of policy is often top down, whether military or otherwise. However, instead of merely complying with the current political priorities, the agents could decide to set the standard or provide an example of the most effective climate change policy across government departments. This would be as simple as the DOD creating policies that significantly decrease defense contribution to greenhouse gas emissions. So once again, what I hope this demonstrated is that the agent-based approach is an effective method for understanding a complex system. In this case, it helped me understand the military and climate change system. And through that, it allows us to make recommendations to change that system by looking at the system structure as understood through DSRP. And by doing that, we can achieve a more desirable future end state. So now I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Ronnie, and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Hi, um, let me just share my screen here. All right, can you all see my presentation okay? Okay, great. Um, hi, I'm Ronnie Schinker. Uh, as Dr. Cabrera mentioned, I've been working with the St. Regis Mohawk Tribe, uh, performing research to assist their internal discussion regarding a comprehensive justice strategy which is what sparked my interest in the justice system. For the paper that I'm presenting on, I use the agent-based approach to map and analyze the prison industrial complex or PIC in America. Using this approach, I determined that the PIC is exceptionally well-designed and good at its purpose of imprisoning an excessive number of people, exploiting their labor and falling far short of anything resembling rehabilitation or the prevention of future crime. A disproportionately high percentage of the 2 million people who are incarcerated are people of color. Black people comprise around 40% of all those who are incarcerated in America, although they represent only about 13% of America's population. Combined, people of color make up about 60% of the prison system, double their proportion of the American population, which is around 30%. These statistics are crucial because they show that the issues covered in this presentation, which concern the PIC, disproportionately impact people of color and especially black Americans who make up the largest proportion of the prison system. Humans make distinctions, observe systems, notice connections, and consider a variety of perspectives every day. DSRP, distinctions, systems, relationships, and perspectives, gives a person the language to actively make note of and communicate these instinctive observations. In making thinking an active process, Essentially, dedicating time and effort to thinking about thinking, someone is more likely to become aware of the flaws and the assumptions they've made about the world. These implicit assumptions are called mental models, and they prevent each person from directly experiencing reality as it is. Humans will always have mental models, and they will always be somewhat flawed, but getting these mental models as close to reality as possible will allow a person to come closer to solving problems through a genuine understanding of the real world. At first, I saw that there were five salient agents in the system that I mapped. Overcrowded public prisons, the Department of Justice, politicians, private prisons, and companies that profit off of prison labor. These agents each follow their own sets of simple rules, which leads to the emergent behavior seen in the system. Once I entered these agents and several important relationships into my map, I noticed a feedback loop between politicians who were elected with tough on crime stances and the constituents who want a tough on crime stance in order to vote, as these specific constituents have become the ones responsible for that politician holding power. At first, I had seen only these somewhat obvious relationships. However, when I went back to the map using structural predictions, I noted that there's also a relationship between the groups that are able to hold the politician accountable. They are all voters. I then saw that by identifying voters, I was also identifying an other group that is excluded, which is non-voters. Of those, a portion are those who have been purposely excluded through the disenfranchisement of those with felony convictions. Using DSRP, I was then able to see that there will still be a relationship between people who've been disenfranchised and politicians. This relationship works two ways. 
First, because tough on crime politicians support laws that impact disenfranchised citizens. And second, a relationship that includes an interference and feedback, which serves to point out the lack of accountability between politicians who were elected with tough on crime stances and the citizens who were not able to vote for or against them. These politicians then support tough on crime legislation in order to placate the citizens who voted for them, and Americans with criminal convictions continue to be disenfranchised by legislation that they have no say in. Explaining this through the language of perspectives, one can see that instead of having all of the American citizens who they should be accountable to as views, politicians who were elected with tough on crime stances have only those specific constituents whose support helps them get elected in their view. Instead of considering all legislation related to incarceration, they view only that which, specific which those specific constituents are interested in, which is what will help them remain in power. Politicians are very willing to take a tough on crime stance in the first place because it is one of the few issues that Americans seem to be continuously willing to tackle by acquiescing to the use of public funds to build more public prisons. When a politician can deliver a concrete result to his or her locality, such as a prison being built and bringing more jobs to that area, that politician is able to appear to be someone who can get things done politically. This is fairly easy to do because of the fear mongering that has been done around crime for decades. Americans wanted to be convinced that pr prisons would work to combat crime. Going through the systems thinking process, I performed an ST loop check once I believed myself to be satisfied with my map, which helped me see that I was still stuck in one of my mental models. Because I had taken prison overcrowding as something for granted that was a crucial part of the system, I was seeing it as only another factor within the system instead of recognizing it as something that was being created by the system, also known as an emergent behavior. Changing this frame of mind allowed me to make the distinction that there was another important component, which was the large number of people in prison who exist separately from the overcrowding of the physical structures of the prison. With this in mind, I was able to compress my map in order to clearly communicate the main identities and relationships. So now I was able to see that we have the harsh laws, such as long mandatory minimum sentences and minimal opportunities for parole, which lead to a large number of people in public prisons. The large number of people in prison benefits the Department of Justice, which sees criminals in prison as a metric of success. It benefits private prisons, which profit from relieving the overcrowding of public prisons. It benefits for-profit companies that exploit cheap prison labor, and it benefits politicians who are seeking to be seen as tough on crime. So we have a system that creates these benefits for these agents. And then each of those agents uses their increased resources and influence to support the harsh laws that lead to those benefits. The DSRP mapping process helped me see the issues that led to my recommendations. I'll focus in on one now, that of private prisons. One of the reasons that politicians willingly support harsh legislation that leads to prison overcrowding is because no one wants for the prison they helped build and politically supported to be closed due to lack of people to imprison. This is where private prisons come in, because no matter how quickly public prisons are built, there are still too many people to imprison. They can't keep up. Private prisons represent a very small percentage of all people incarcerated in America, but they act as a release valve for public prisons that are impossibly overcrowded. This leads me to one of my recommendations, which is for private prisons to cease to exist. Were private prisons to not exist, the issue of prison overcrowding would have no release valve and politicians would have no alternative but to confront the harsh sentencing laws that consistently lead to prison overcrowding. They would be forced to support legislation that allows for shorter sentences and greater access to parole. Another recommendation is focused on incarcerated people who are agents in the prison industrial complex. The recommendation concerns incarcerated people using their collective power to regain their voting rights. Ideally, this would force politicians to recognize them as a powerful group of voters and would allow the incarcerated or formerly, formerly incarcerated to regain some measure of control over the legislation that impacts them. For example, once their voting rights are no longer restricted, they can advocate for politicians to pass legislation regarding nonviolent crimes in order to enable those who commit them to have universal access to medically certified rehabilitation programs instead of forced confinement in prison. So based on these factors and others that are explained in my paper, I made recommendations for those incarcerated to realize their collective power for politicians to mandate the dignity of prisoners to be respected through paying them a living wage for their work, 
and for the DOJ to create a new metric of success while also ending its relationship with private prisons. So thank you for listening. And now I'm going to pass it on to Daniel. Hi, everyone. Um, let me just bring up the slides here. All right, my name is uh, Dan Sharpars, and I will be talking about the US presidential electoral system, as well as some of the reforms I came up with based on my agent-based approach analysis of that system. So first off, why did I choose to do an ABA uh, analysis for this? I chose it because the US presidential electoral system is indeed a complex adaptive system, um, which makes it very appropriate to look at the agents and the simple rules they follow in order to help identify how the system operates. Secondly, I chose an ABA uh, method because, frankly speaking, a lot of the um, components of the system are made up of people and, and their decision making processes can be quite complex and diverse. So it really excludes the possibility of using uh, agent based modeling, simply because we just don't have the technology to accurately predict the behavior of 320 million Americans, even more at this point. Um, so once I had determined that an ABA method was appropriate, I started with the first step of the DSRP mapping process where I physically mapped out my understanding of the system. Uh, this was a really important step both to get my bearings about what I understood and to understood where, understand where I needed to focus future research in order to get a better you know, understanding of the system. I used a lot of structural predictions and the ST feedback loop for this process. Structural predictions were very important in identifying uh, future areas of focus for my research. Systems thinking logic dictates that there is a relationship between everything. Every part has a whole and every whole has a part. Uh, because of that, you can look at the DSRP map and say, I know that there is some kind of relationship between, let's say, political parties and media coverage, but I don't fully understand that connection. And you can create a structural prediction and it, it creates a template for you to direct your future research. I also use the ST feedback loop a lot, not just for the DSRP mapping process, but for the ABA process as a whole. Um, the ST feedback loop is taking what you see in reality and using that to confirm that your assumptions about your model are correct. Um, this is really important for keeping and making sure that your model is grounded in reality. Without using the ST feedback loop, there's nothing to keep your model from being a total fictional work that really is not helpful to anyone. Um, once I had uh, used the DSRP process to map out my understanding of the system, I moved on to the POSUID analysis. And as you know, the purpose of a system is what it does. Uh, the outcomes you see, it doesn't really matter if these outcomes are by design, if they're accidental or whatever. The outcome you get from a system is by definition the POSUID. Um, the DSRP mapping process for this was very helpful, both for identifying these possibilities and more importantly, identifying the root differences and outcomes we see or uh, root differences that contribute to the difference in outcome we see uh, between the possibility, the current possibility and what we would like the system, how we would like the system to ideally function. Um, for example, I had multiple possibilities for my system, but one of the possibilities was this current system is very effective at discounting the voters of a significant or the votes of a significant portion of Americans. And this is a common criticism with the system. Uh, if you vote for a candidate in a certain state and a, another candidate wins in that state, in most states, your vote does not count because all of the electoral college delegates are given to the winning candidate. So we can use the DSRP mapping process to identify that the root difference between the possibility and what we'd like to see where every vote is counted is that disproportional allocation of delegates in the electoral college process. Once I had identified the possibilities, I felt that I was ready to move on to the CAS analysis where I was identifying the agents and the simple rules they follow. This really is the, the crux of an agent-based approach um, because understanding the agents and the simple rules is critical for coming up with good recommendations. I see the simple rules personally as essentially the possibility of the agents. Uh, it doesn't matter what the intentions of these agents are or what they're trying to do. The outcome and behavior you see is by definition the simple rules they follow. One thing I think that is really important to keep in mind, especially for a system such as the one I was looking at, is uh, you do have to generalize a little bit. 
Um, people are very complex and it would not be very practical to create a map uh, or to create simple rules that perfectly apply to every single voter in this country. So generalization is something you have to do a little bit um, and you have to strike that balance. I don't think this is really an issue with the agent-based approach specifically, but it's rather a challenge that we face with any kind of modeling uh, of a system. As the famous quote goes, all models are wrong, but some models are useful. So striking that balance between generalizing enough um, and being specific enough that you can actually apply those rules is, is important and really critical to making sure your, your system works like reality or as closely to reality as possible. So once I had done my cast analysis, I felt that I was ready to come up with some recommendations. I came up with five recommendations for the system. Prior to coming up with these recommendations, I created some rules that these recommendations could not violate. My own rules for these were recommendations could not be unconstitutional. They could not directly impact more than one set of agents, and they had to be realistic in their implementation. Personally, I feel my rules two and three, uh, realism of implementation and only directly impacting one set of agents are really rules that could apply to pretty much any recommendation for any agent-based approach. Um, trying to create a recommendation that's gonna directly impact more than one group of agents, well, I wouldn't say it was impossible. I think it would certainly add to the difficulty and complexity of implementing that recommendation. Um, indirect changes to agents as a result of a direct change to other agents are fine, and in fact, even encouraged but a direct change to two just seems impractical. Now, the recommendations I came up with are as follows. My first recommendation was to implement ranked choice voting both in the general elections and the party primaries. Uh, the agents targeted for this recommendation would actually be the states and how they conduct their elections, but it would have an indirect impact on the voters by changing the psychology of how they vote. One of the simple rules I had set up for voters was again generalizing, but they tend to vote to defeat the opposition candidate in the primaries rather than voting for the candidate they like the most. And this is something that I use the ST feedback loop to confirm. I looked at you know real world examples and real world studies and it did confirm that the, the spoiler effect as it called had that impact. So implementing ranked choice voting would essentially negate the spoiler effect and ideally change the simple rules that voters follow to instead vote for the candidate they prefer most. My second recommendation was to implement more public finance opportunities for campaigns. This, uh, the agents targeted for this would be the candidates running and would ideally reduce the risk or chances of them compromising on their own beliefs or the beliefs of their constituency in order to secure funding for their uh, campaigns. And securing funding is a simple rule that candidates follow. Uh, my third recommendation is proportional delegate allegation in the Electoral College. This would ensure that votes are counted regardless of who wins that state, and it would essentially negate the original postulate I had mentioned in my previous slide of votes being discounted. My fourth recommendation would be to amend or repeal the 1996 Telecommunications Act. This was the act that was directly responsible for the massive concentration and ownership we see in media outlets today. Um, I use the ST feedback loop to confirm that because of this concentration, the groups that own these uh, companies exert a disproportionate influence on the American public because of that concentration. So essentially amending this act would dilute the influence that those groups have on the American public. And my fifth recommendation was to lower the polling threshold for debates in the general debate. Um, this one would actually be targeting an influential actor rather than agents, that actor being uh, the debate committee. But I feel that this was worth mentioning because it would have a lot of synergy with uh, my first recommendation. Uh, it would create more exposure opportunities for smaller candidates, uh, such as independent parties or what have you, to uh, get recognized in the public. Um, and with the change in the first, uh, in the simple rules voters follow of uh, voting for the candidate you prefer most, I believe that synergy would create a lot of uh, diversity in voting options. So those were my recommendations. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time to listen to my presentation. I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, thank you. Wow, thank, thank you all. That was, that was great. I mean, that's really just a pleasure for me to listen to, I think maybe as a fellow student in particular, I think it's just really very informative and interesting. Um, so we'll move into question and answer period. Um, but before I sort of dive into the, the Q&A as part of the conference, I was hoping that each of you could maybe talk just a little bit about 
you know, the particular personal background, maybe any expertise that you brought to this project and how, and if even that changed during the course of your ABA analysis, um, and maybe the influence of metacognition or structural predictions or any of the specific tools that, that you talked about. But if you could just elaborate a little bit on that, that would be great. Um, and I guess just to make things simple, why don't we start um, start with James and go through the, the same order as the presentation? Yeah, uh, sure, uh, great question, Ben. Uh, so a little bit of my background, right? I did mention that uh, I've been uh, in the military for approximately nine years. Uh, so like coming into this, having seen, I guess, another end of defense policy, I did have certain uh, ideas about how things worked. And really what I found is as I started mapping that system, sorry, I should add also like, I had not really explored uh, climate change in depth to actually understand the implications specifically to the military. And that was really my goal of this was more looking at how that impacts my job, uh, less of actually how the military functions through defense policy. However, what I found is that a lot of the things that uh, I had thought uh, as I continue to map things out and as Dan uh, really hit on with the system sticking feedback loop, uh, really matching my mental model to reality and how many times going through that, I needed to change what I thought. Uh, so I will say uh, it was an interesting uh, process uh, working through even just the DSRP analysis to challenge uh, some of the, the preconceived notions I had of that system. Yeah, um, so then I, I mentioned that the internship that I have right now kind of sparked um, my wanting to focus on the justice system for this project. But outside of that, um, I had also read a lot of different books that kind of um, give the perspective of the justice system being bad. So I definitely came into it with that bias um, and I was very aware of that bias. So I really wanted to, when I did my map, I really wanted to try to look for as unbiased of a perspective as possible. Um, so that I could really determine whether um, that, you know, assumption that I'd come into it with was accurate. Um, so I feel like, yeah, the ST loop checks were very important. Um, and also um, what Derek mentioned earlier today about, you know, distinctions and it, it being really important what distinctions you choose to put into the map. Um, that's that first step um, is really the most important one because you need to know what you're working with. Um, so, so yeah, I think that that's kind of how I tried to combat my own um, bias coming into it because I definitely, I'm not an expert, but um, had interacted with a lot of literature on the prison system. I, uh, I agree with uh, both James and Ronnie. Uh, the SD feedback loop is essential to address your biases. And I definitely came into this with a bias. Um, I would be lying if I said I didn't. Um, but using that SD feedback loop, I think that's really a strength of systems thinking is it has this built-in tool to kind of recognize, help recognize your own bias. Um, I also really value uh, the perspectives part of the DSRP because it helps you realize that regardless of what you look at, you have to remember that it's through your own perspective that you're seeing it. Um, so that I think that really helps me recognize uh, my own biases and, you know, helps with metacognition. That's great. That's great. So I think, Ronnie, you mentioned, you know, maybe having been fairly well acquainted or acquainted to some degree with the literature. And I'm, um, I'm curious to know if you could talk a little bit about, you know, the framing and stopping rules that you used and how that kind of allowed you to interact more effectively with that literature kind of um, during the process of your analysis. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the mistake that I actually made when I began creating my map was um, that I attempted to include a lot of historical information to give context as to why the system is the way that it is today. And um, this historical information is absolutely extremely important. Um, but in this context, those historical perspectives aren't as important as the range of factors that are really impacting the system today, right now. So it was through performing those ST loop checks that I revealed my mental model 
that the functioning of the system today could not be grasped without acknowledging every historical decision that led to it, which does not match reality. Um, the prison industrial complex is a complex system, um, but that complexity is still based on agents following simple rules, which can be determined by mapping what's happening today. Um, so when I realized that that historical information wasn't going to get me any closer to the immediate understanding that I was seeking from the map, um, I amended my framing and stopping rules or fropping rules, um, which you know delineate the scope of the project in order to indicate that I was only going to include present day aspects. Um, so for example, there are a wide range of laws in every single state um, determining that felons can't uh, vote or the exact you know time that felons would be able to vote and things like that. Um, but it, it wasn't crucial for me to understand each of those laws in each 50 in each of the 50 states in order to understand that disenfranchisement was happening. So that's the relevant aspect to my map. And so if you want to um, combat that, eventually, you know, you need to know all those details, but for getting an understanding of the system, you don't need that level of detail. It is, I mean, I think it's a really powerful use, you know, as much as I sort of chuckle at the term fropping rules, um, I think it really is a powerful tool, and to me, that that's an, a perfect example of how you can you can really focus on, you know, practical, um, you know, what to do now. I think that's that's fantastic. And sort of along a similar line, um, Dan, you mentioned you know a fair number of recommendations specifically, and I'm I'm curious to know, um, you know, there's a there's a million different pundits who are all concerned with the political science and sort of the perceived failings of elections in the US or various election systems. And I'm curious to know in your analysis, or even in your opinion, really, if there's a particular hierarchy to the recommendations you provided, or if there's a sequence, um, or if there's a way that you think those would be most effectively implemented. Yeah, um, I think if I had to pick one recommendation out of the five, I would certainly pick ranked choice voting. Um, I felt that that one was particularly important because it directly changes the simple rules that the voters follow. Um, and I see voters as the most influential agent in this system. Um, so anything that's gonna directly impact the, or not indirectly impact the simple rules they follow um, or make any kind of change to their simple rules, I think is gonna have the biggest effect. Um, so I would rank that one first. And the other is uh, it's much tougher to rank. I would um, probably place um, the debate threshold one as last, but the other three, it's tough to say it's a toss up between those three. I, they're all tied in my opinion. Um, without testing the model, it'd be hard to say. Right, but so coming out of that, there is at least a, a pretty clear number one. Yes, ranked choice voting is easily number one in my belief um, and the rest are kind of even. That's cool. Yeah, I was trying to imagine a world where you changed the polling thresholds or or something along those lines without also chain, you know, implementing ranked choice. And it does, you know, at least intuitively, there's a there's a sort of embedded conflict there. Um, so the next question is for James. And I think, you know, you you analyzed the military response, the military relationship with climate change specifically. Um, and obviously that relationship constrains the implications of the analysis and your recommendation to some degree, right? You're talking about that relationship. Um, but I'm just curious to know if there's if there's maybe some some application of your recommendations or if they might apply in other types of organizations, other private public organizations, and how you would see being able to maybe translate or not translate those recommendations into different organizational types or contexts. Yeah, I think uh, you could definitely take some of those recommendations and apply them to another organization. However, what I say is it probably wouldn't work. Uh, so what you don't see is uh, through all of this process that each of us have talked about, and as well as the, the panels before this, is the amount of detail that goes into this analysis. Even though they may seem like simple presentations, I think uh, Anna Lee Wilson, who presented earlier, is a perfect example. If you saw her, because all, each of us have mapped out these systems, right? And with mine, I just gave you two blocks, the military and climate change, and drew a few, drew a few lines. But what it took to get to that and understanding that was months of us digging into documents, like Ronnie said, through reading the literature to continue to use the systems thinking feedback loop to understand what reality is telling us about these systems. 
it took so long and so much analysis just to understand the system that to come to those recommendations was not just, hmm, let's throw some stuff to the wall and see what sticks. Uh, no, it was, they were very targeted and it was through continual digging into understanding, okay, which distinction do I need to work on? Which system should I look at further? Do I need to look bigger? Do I need to look smaller? Which relationship? Is this arrow going both ways? Is it going one? What is, should there be another one? Or what perspectives haven't I considered? Again, one of the things that Laura talked about before was um, continually having uh, uh, anthropomorphic, excuse me, uh, uh, perspectives on a system and challenging that, not to just use those, but to look at things from a different perspective. For mine specifically, look at it from a defense perspective, look at it from a risks perspective. So uh, short answer is no, it can't directly apply to another organization because the level of specificity that required for each of these approaches uh, is for that problem alone. What I would say, the only thing that would translate is the agent-based approach. I think you can use that as has been demonstrated as we're demonstrating all day. You can use that for any system to provide recommendations. That's, that's fantastic. So we're really talking about, you know, an analysis that's very, very specific that really, I think is tailored to exactly what you're, what you're addressing in that moment. I think that's, that's really, it's nice to hear you talk about that. I think that's important. Um, so with that, I'm going to move to the questions in the, in the chat. Um, so if there's a little bit of a, a stutter in my voice, I apologize for my, my translating errors. Um, but the first one that's popping out at me, um, and maybe Dan, you could address this because you talked a lot about the ST loop, but um, someone in the chat is asking for maybe a little bit more details about what that means, um, maybe both at the conceptual and the, the practical level. So what it is and how you, how you use it. Sure. Um, the theory behind it is essentially is you create a mental model of how a system works in your mind. Um, and the ST feedback loop is you essentially going to reality outside of your model um, and looking at what you see and using that to confirm that your assumptions about your model are correct. So for example, um, for me specifically, I had uh, my discussion about the spoiler effect, how the spoiler effect caused uh, people in the primaries to often vote for the candidate they felt was most qualified to defeat the opposition rather than voting for the candidate they liked the most. And so for the ST feedback, that was my model assumption. Um, and I went to, to reality, I looked at the news, I looked at you know studies of, uh, research done on the psychology of voters to confirm that that was indeed the case, that voters do tend to vote for the candidate that's most likely to beat the opposition rather than the candidate they like the most in the party primary. Um, so the ST feedback loop is basically a way of just saying, uh, making sure what you, your assumption about the model is correct by looking at real world sources, citations in a way. Thank you. I I believe if, if there's any more clarification, feel free to you know put questions in the chat as we go. But Dan, I think that covers it, Dan. That's great. Um, the next one will be is for Ronnie, presumably because this uh, this deals with prison specifically. Um, so there's a question in the chat about how um, how you would address or how you would think about um, lobbying within the political political sphere and within um, elections and how how you think that affects politicians who are tough on crime and sort of how that would integrate with your analysis. Yeah, absolutely. I think I kind of touched on that towards the end when I mentioned that um, these all of the entities that are benefiting from having prisons be overcrowded um, are using that those resources um, and influence in order to keep the system the way that it is. Um, so, so yeah, I would say that that's how lobbying factors in is that private prisons take their profits and use a portion of them to continue to have the system be the way that it is with these harsh laws. That's great. And there's actually another question that is probably fairly similar that deals with um, prisons and particularly private prisons as a source of jobs in a local community and how that's dealt with. So I don't know if you want to take that one separately or if that sort of falls into a fairly similar uh, similar category. Yeah, um, actually, Ruth Wilson Gilmore has a great book on this uh, called Golden Gulag. Um, and she 
really is able to go through specifically with within the prison system in California, um, which is the state that incarcerates the most people in America. Um, and she really goes through with with a specific town, the expectations that that town had in bringing a prison to that town, um, what they thought that it would do to revitalize the economy of that small town, um, what it, they thought that it would do for jobs, and then what ended up actually happening was that most of those jobs went to people outside of the town who really didn't even need to move there because um, of the, the ease that people have with commuting in California. Um, so I would say that that's um, a specific instance um, that that is kind of applicable as far as these prisons don't actually do what they're promised to do. It's just that the politicians are able to use those promises to get prisons built so that they have more influence themselves. Um, excuse me. So I'm, I'm just reading through the questions here. There's a there's another question. There's a question for James, rather, that's actually maybe a fairly similar mold in that it adds just another distinction to your analysis. And the distinction here is private military contractors and just some general curiosity about how you think your analysis would impact them. Would they be responsive enough to be able to make changes and adapt? Um, and again, I guess fairly similar, ultimately, how would you, how would you integrate that, that new distinction into, into your thinking? Uh, so, uh, now, part of I'll go back to the framing and stopping rules that I used uh, or the fropping rules. So uh, I did not look specifically at private military contractors and how they interacted within the system. I did include them, though, within uh, with defense contractors in the system as just its own distinction. But based on the level analysis that I was going for and the direction I was going with it, I didn't fully explore like how they actually integrate those policies. So again, I think that that is a, uh, a worthwhile thing. I think somebody uh, mentioned earlier um, or in a previous conversation that without those dropping rules, you really could analyze uh, ad nauseum. Uh, and so what I found is you had to limit yourself somewhere. Um, you have to create uh, what are the boundaries of my analysis uh, and I think that's key. Otherwise, you could I could explore that specifically, just military or private military contractors and how the defense policy related to climate change impacts them and how they feed into that. Uh, so I will say that wasn't part of my analysis, uh, but that is a way, another way that you could approach it. That's yeah. I mean, that really is to me the core piece. So thank you, thank you for that. I think that's really the the strength of the analysis is the focus. Um, so we have maybe just a minute or two left. Um, and there's actually been an, a couple of questions in the chat that are all focused on um, how do you know you've succeeded? How do you measure impacts? Um, you know, and as I understand ABA in general, um, ABA is really about creating those recommendations based on sort of that conceptual framework. But I'm curious to know, your thoughts about how you would conceive of impact measuring and viewing success, um, specifically within you know, a framework like systems thinking that really is designed to be, um, you know, as Dan mentions, it's a loop, right? It's a continuous loop. So it's an iterative infinite loop that we, that we have to address. But I'm curious specifically about, you know, is there a piece in your system that you would see as being, you know, all right, we've reached the, the future the future positive, the desired end state. What do you think is the most critical in that regard? And, you know, we I, I may have talked a little bit too long in answer, asking that question. So we only have just a quick, a quick minute or two. Um, so maybe we could just end quickly with each of you giving, you know, just maybe a sentence or two on what you think is the most critical success measure um, in your analysis. Um, and again, just same order that we went. So just, just finish it up for us. Um, yeah, I would, oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I would say the uh, critical success measure in the analysis is just understanding the structure, because once you have that base, you continue to change it with reality. And when you're applying those recommendations, uh, once you make that little bit of change, you can see then once that's applied with systems thinking feedback loop, how that had changed the system, how that changed the system or the emergent properties. 
Um, maybe I interpreted the question a little differently, but I was thinking of how you measure success in the system. And so for mine, um, I think that right now each person is seen as a criminal to be punished. And I think that the system will be fundamentally different. And I would say that it's successful when each person is instead seen as a citizen to be rehabilitated. Uh, my response is pretty much similar to James's. Um, just looking at using that ST feedback loop to confirm uh, whether the postulate the, that you originally diagnosed is still happening or not would be the main mechanism of how I'd identify whether you've had success with your changes or not. That is, that is fantastic. So we'll, we'll close it there. I just want to end by saying thank you to all of you for coming. Um, it really is fantastic to have you here and just talking talking through how this, how the approach was used and what you did specifically um, is really great. And again, just to reiterate that, you know, as a fellow student, I think it's particularly inspiring for me to hear about how you all, you all approached it. So thank you again. And with that, we will close and move on to the next panel.